from Fox 13. This is a special edition, remembering Oso 10 years later. 43 people swept away in the deadliest landslide in U.S. history. Why did this happen? An entire community wiped out. It's gone. Like Steelhead Drive is gone. An entire nation in mourning. The whole country's thinking about you. <laughs> Through it all, the people of Oso showed us what was best in us. It's amazing to see the community come together. The small town in America. Coming together. Yeah, we gave them the toys. <laughs> to show us the meaning of community. We're like practically family here. And when you hear that your family's hurting, it just hurts you too. Refusing to give up on each other. You can't walk away. We've seen the damage. We've grieved with the families. And now, a decade later, we take a look at how the community is healing. Moving forward with new hope. And with a permanent place to grieve with their loved ones. I promised my sister and I promised my parents that this would happen in their lifetime. And I'm so happy like that, that it did. This is Oso, 10 years later. Thank you so much for joining us as we mark 10 years since the country's deadliest landslide. I'm David Rose. And I'm Hannah Kim. We are at the site of the permanent memorial that just opened. And behind us, you see the slide scar. It is emotional and stunning to see it all these years later. It used to be known as Steelhead Haven. It was a place once packed with houses, families, toys in the backyard. You'll hear the stories of those families and how they're recovering. You'll also see never before released photos and videos. But first, let's take a look back at how we got here. March 22nd, 2014. It should have been a quiet morning. I was mowing the lawn. Uh, my wife and I were waking up. Doing some grout stuff. It was 10.37 a.m. on a Saturday. Most families were enjoying breakfast when the unimaginable happened. A one-mile stretch of scenic hillside gave way, sending 18 million tons of sand and debris into the Stillaguamish River below. Their worst case scenario didn't match this. That's enough to cover 600 football fields 10 feet deep, making it the deadliest landslide in U.S. history. The day that changed our lives forever. An entire neighborhood along Steelhead Drive wiped out. There's like a mud fire and everything's gone. The houses are gone. What? Is there any injuries? Oh, there's a police. What's the address there? No, no, that was like a mud slide. I mean, all I see is dirt now. We watched tons of the trees come fall. Okay, is there any that is no longer. I'm on a two post road on Highway 530. I'm not in a house here anymore. This map shows the devastation caused along Highway 530. The landslide covered one square mile. At one point, more than 200 people were missing as the rain hampered rescue workers' efforts. The rain and the wind and the weather is basically working against us. It took more than six weeks to find all of the victims. In all, 43 members of the community were killed. Little children should never die. You'll see kids' clothes, you see baby clothes, and that starts to tug on you. 49 homes and other structures destroyed. I've never seen anything like it. A small, quiet community rattled by the realization that nothing will ever be the same. You could feel how upset everybody was. You could feel how sad everybody was and that it's hard to be normal. It's hard to just go on and teach school and, and be in class and not think about your classmates that are gone. Crews from all over the state rushed to help. And I'm just going, somebody lost her book. And I could see it was a kid's book. And I opened the book and it said, Three Orphan Kitties was the title. And underneath it, it said, the world is a beautiful place. And I just burst into tears and, and dropped a knee. A landslide so massive and a pain so deep, it's tough to even comprehend. When I flew over the area on Sunday, I said that you needed to see it to believe it. Now that I've seen it from the ground, I must tell you that I still can't believe what I saw. The magnitude of what happened here reaching Washington, D.C., then President Obama visited the area to tour the destruction. Their families have lost everything and it's going to be a difficult uh, road ahead for them. In the 10 years since, trees have started growing over the slide scars. But the scars on the community, those will never heal. I miss my neighbors so much today. <laughs> March 22nd of every year, as long as God gives me breath, this is where I will be. 
This is my first time to visit the site here. It is something everybody needs to see. It is truly breathtaking and gives you time to pause and reflect. I know you were out here covering this 10 years ago. What stands out to you? Yeah, I just can't believe it was 10 years ago, but I just remember, you know, when I first came here, I think even the reporters didn't understand the gravity of what we were about to experience and the people that just had to come together in those desperate times. I just remember that staying with me, the outpouring of support, the donations that would pour in all from all over over this area and I just thought that that was a beautiful thing during those really really difficult times and over this special we're gonna honor the volunteers who helped so many people in Darrington Arlington and Oso everybody I've talked to said I can't believe it's been 10 years a lot of people feel like it was just four years ago for the people who've lived this and who've worked every day to build this memorial for the public it's been 10 years of pain as you just heard the world was watching and former President Obama visited the area as rescue efforts were going on he commanded Commended the communities of Oso, Darrington, and Arlington and said the way they came together was an inspiration to the world. Because this is also what America is all about. When times get tough, we look out for each other. Uh, we get each other's backs and we recover and we build and we come back stronger. Uh, and we're always reminded that we're greater together. They understood that this wasn't an ordinary job. This wasn't just a matter of moving earth, uh, that this was a matter of uh, making sure that we were honoring uh, and respecting uh, the lives that had been impacted. He also expedited disaster declarations to make sure the community got the help they needed. When this happened, it was a national wake-up call about the dangers of landslides. Washington State began hiring more staff and conducting more mapping to get a better handle on the risk. And the state tightened guidelines on logging landslide-prone slopes and concerns that clear-cutting near the top of the scar might have helped cause the disaster. In 2020, Congress adopted the National Landslides Preparedness Act to create a national strategy to identify, understand, and protect against landslides. It was legislation pushed by lawmakers from Washington State. This is all in the hopes that no other community will have to endure what Oso, Darrington, and Arlington had to go through. There were truly incredible stories of heroism that came out of what happened here. You might remember the story of four-year-old Jacob, who was rescued. I sat down with one of the pilots aboard Snowhawk 10, who was part of the crew that brought him home to safety. These are never-before-released photos showing the devastation from the slide, a scene that was still shifting when the Snohomish County helicopter rescue team first arrived. Ed Rivnack was the co-pilot that day in Snowhawk 10. It was actually uh, overwhelming, and uh, Steve Klett that I was flying with, uh, he knows the area very well. I mean, we've flown up there for years, and I knew the area too, and when we came over, we were looking around, it was like, this isn't right. And I remember Steve going, where's Oso? Houses had exploded. Cars were crushed into small pieces, only the tires remaining. He says it was difficult to process the magnitude. And the other thing that was really hard to figure out is when we, we came into hover to start doing rescues, it was hard to get into hovering position because everything was still moving. And I remember trying to do a hoist and Steve was like, hey, you're drifting. I'm like, no, I'm rock solid. And he said, no, you're... And then I finally realized everything was moving beneath me and it was, it was disorienting. Survivors covered in mud, looking to the skies for help when they heard the sound of the Huey's rotors. There were people that uh, they were like putting their hand on their heart and pointing down saying, that's where my family is, or that's what I figured they're saying. It's like my house used to be there. This is where I think you know, a family member is. Danger was everywhere. A propane tank venting near the helicopter, not far from a fire. Their rotors churning up debris. Then I saw a piece of insulation pick up, and I'm like, hey, we're starting to pick up debris. He's like, yep, I got it. And this thing kind of went around in front of us and then got sucked right up into the rotor and exploded into a million pieces. The engine's intake filter caught it. They kept flying, committed. Regardless of the propane, the fire, the, the debris, we're going to get as many people as we can. That includes a four-year-old boy named Jacob, found up to his knees in concrete-like compressed mud. The only way to get to him was to lower the helicopter down to the skids. There were two guys, two first responders, volunteers, that got to Jacob and were trying to bring him to us, but the mud was just so thick. So uh, there was a massive clay ball there, 
and Steve was able to bring the aircraft over and just kind of like teeter the skid onto it so our rescuer, Randy, could get out and get down to him. The mud packed so tightly around his little body, his pants came off when he was pulled out. Seeing a little kid come in about the same uh, size and age of my daughter, that was tough. Jacob had been home with his father, a chief petty officer with the U.S. Navy, and his three siblings. He was the only survivor. He said he didn't cry. I think he was too shocked, but he said he didn't cry. That's Jacob's mom. She'd been at the store when the slide hit. It's just awesome. They found him. Just seeing all that stuff out there, because I've been out there a few times to see the site, and just to know where we lived and where they found him is just unbelievable. As luck would have it, the Snowhawk 10 crew had already been flying a training mission that morning when they got the radio call for help. We were the first aircraft on scene, and in that first fuel cycle, at first hour and a half on station, we, uh, we rescued eight people. They'd risked a lot to save a lot. By nightfall, they'd recovered 12 people alive. As more resources arrived, three more were lifted to safety. As things unfolded, more aircraft came in. Airlift Northwest came in. We set up a landing zone. Woodby Island came in. And we started doing this round robin because we had the rescue hoist. And so we could hoist someone and take it to LZ, transfer to airlift, and go. And I, and I can remember one person that we transferred to them. They ended up doing CPR right there on the, on, in the grass uh, because the person was so unstable and so severely injured. Ed says it was reminiscent of his time in Iraq, where he served two tours as a flight nurse. When he thinks back to what happened here 10 years ago, he downplays his role. I think the real heroism I saw was the town of Oso, the Oso Fire Department. You know, we were working with guys who had lost loved ones, and they were still working. The helicopter rescue team stayed on scene for the next six weeks to fly support for those rescuers, sometimes so exhausted they needed a lift out. Mostly, Ed remembers how the community came together. And to see it go from one volunteer fire department, one helicopter, and the expansion in a short amount of time, it, it, it's like, wow. To see that organization and to know that we have that capability and that we can do that, um, it's, it's reassuring to me that if that happens again, if something like OSO happens again in Washington State, I know we're ready for it because we proved it there at OSO. I asked Ed if some of the rescuers and family members have told him what they thought about all the helicopters being here for six weeks providing support. He said it's interesting. He said that some of the rescuers hear those helicopter blades and it feels like signs of hope. Mm -hmm. He also heard from family members who say they can't stand to hear the sound of the helicopters because it reminds them of what happened here in Oso. Yeah. Coming up, there's a huge hole in our family. The woman who had to go to six different funerals for family members killed in the Oso landslide. Why she says the pain got so bad, she can't live in Oso anymore. And the enduring strength of two brothers who made a promise to the community they love. Even leaving one person unaccounted for just wasn't acceptable. We'll introduce you to the volunteer firefighters who refused to leave until every single person was found.
It's just incomprehensible to think about what these families lost. They chose this area because of its beauty. It's quiet, it's scenic, a place to build their lives away from the city noise. We've heard from so many family members of these victims, and one of the strongest voices has been Jessica Pizanka. And imagine this, she had to go to six different funerals for her family members. 43 tolls for 43 people every March 22nd for the last 10 years. I literally remember every single little thing about that first 24 hours. Six of those tolls are for Jessica Pizanka. She lost six members of her family. I lost my sister Katie, um, her husband Shane, my two nephews Hunter and Wyatt, and then Shane's parents Lou and Judy. It was a normal Saturday morning for her. She was doing some work around the house when she got a text alerting her to a landslide in the area. I you know, texted my sister, tried calling her, didn't hear anything, you know, went to Facebook Messenger because sometimes service wasn't great out there. When she couldn't reach her family, she called a friend who was a firefighter. And I remember it like yesterday, he said, it's gone. Like steelhead drive is gone. Like there is nothing left. And that like, ugh to this day is like like that conversation happened yesterday. They lived on Steelhead Drive, the subdivision that was wiped out, but still the family held out hope their loved ones would be found alive. We're like, ah, they're gonna find them, like I know they will. That's until they heard the words that would forever change their lives. He just told my dad, I'm sorry, like it's, it's gone, they're gone. Like it's, yeah. So it was, it was a rough, rough day. Katie and her husband Shane owned a glass business together. Shane's parents, Lou and Judy, had just moved to the area from Spokane. Lou served in the Marines. Judy operated a bar for years. And two of the youngest victims, six-year-old Hunter and four-year-old Wyatt. All six of them had been swept up in the landslide. Three generations of one family, gone within minutes. They were your typical all-American family. And they came out here, Shane loved the outdoors, and their house was like our little slice of heaven. In the years since, Jessica has turned her pain into action. She made a promise to her sister that there would be a permanent place where victims' families could go to grieve. I think that the families deserved more than just some trees on the side of a freeway. The second part of that for me, and it's almost right up there as, as important as the family, is these guys. The first responders, Darrington Fire, Arlington Fire, Oso, all of these men and women stuck it out there and saw some of the most terrible, awful, terrible things you could possibly see and feel in life to bring my family back to me. But now that her promise to her sister is fulfilled, after 10 years, the pain is still so bad that they can't bear to live here any longer. We're leaving it in good hands with the community and, you know, the, the triggers around here for my parents, it, it's hard. It's hard to go to the high school where Hunter would be playing football. It's hard to not know that we're not gonna take you know, see pictures of him going to the dances and all those things that we're missing out, that we're living through with my nieces, we don't get to see with the boys, and it's not fair. After the opening of the permanent memorial, she and her family plan to move out of state. The triggers of the area are never going to go away for us, and especially for my parents, and I want the later part of my parents' life to be a little happier. There's a huge hole in our family. And there will always be a huge hole. And, that, and that's one thing, you know, I've sat down with both my parents um, when we started talking about this moving out of state and all that. Like, that hole will still be there. And we're not trying to kind of fill that hole, but we're trying to kind of help with the daily triggers of that hole. But there will always be a hole in our family. As with many people who experience a tragedy like this, she too had a crisis of faith. What kind of God would take babies and little kids and you know, all these men and women that were in the military that served our country and all these things. It's like, it's very hard to fathom that. But she'll leave Oso knowing that she left behind a piece of herself and a permanent place where people can think of their loved ones. I find zero peace going to, to the cemetery where they're called Mary Miss. I don't feel them there. I don't, it's just so final and so, I just, I, I can't bring myself to do it. 
When I go up there, I could feel my sister. I could feel the family. I could hear their voices. I could, you know, all the things. Um, I get up there and I get sort of like a peace when you're up there. Jessica's family will be packing up and moving to Texas in the coming weeks, but it's really hard to ignore that she was such a driving force that we even have this permanent memorial. What she left behind is truly special. It's a place that when you come here, you'll have time to reflect and see the magnitude of the disaster. Coming up, don't kick us out because we're, we're not leaving. Two brothers, both volunteer firefighters, both refusing to leave until every single person was found, no matter how long it took. How they kept their promise and the legacy now being fulfilled a decade later. Then a look inside the new permanent memorial giving families a safe place to grieve. weeks and weeks searching for people. It was agonizing and a grueling task. And the weather was wet, it was cold, it wasn't anything like it is when we're out here today. It was exhausting. But there were two brothers that grew up in Oso that vowed they would stay here until every person was found. Dedicated, brave, strong. Those are the words found on the wall inside the Oso Fire Department. Those are the words Tim and Willie Harper live by. The brothers grew up in Oso. They live in Oso. They've dedicated their lives to Oso. And in 2014, when a massive landslide wiped out an entire part of Oso, they dedicated countless hours to bringing the people of Oso back home. The day started off like any other. Willie Harper was doing yard work when he got the call for a tarp in the middle of the road. Didn't seem like a big call, so not a big deal. Uh, four miles up the road, we get to the site, and there was definitely a roof in the road, amongst other things. There was power lines down, there was trees, there was debris, which we didn't know at the time what it was, and a lot of mud. Tim was at a kid's birthday party. I think we took a break from all the screaming kids, so we went out and turned the radio on, and uh, we're listening in on the call. And it wasn't a few minutes in, once he was on scene, we could 
kind of hear the tone of his voice change, and we knew that it was a lot bigger than what was, you know, came out on the, as, you know, as the call. Within minutes, both of their lives would change forever. So I had one of the guys climb up on top of one of the log piles, and when he did, he looked, and I said, what do you see? And he looked towards Darren, and he goes, I can't see anything. I'm like, I, I don't understand. What do you mean you can't see anything? He goes, it's gone. The road's gone. The house are gone. Everything's gone. All I see is debris field. The magnitude of what they were dealing with hit them. More than 200 of their friends and neighbors missing. That's when they made a promise. There would be no person left behind. But you just can't. You can't walk away. Like, we're already invested in this community. We grew up here. Um, even leaving one person unaccounted for just wasn't acceptable. No matter how hard, how emotionally and physically exhausting, even traumatizing it got, they soldiered on. When you're finding pieces of people, I mean, we were, we were looking for any single identifiable, identifiable piece of a person, which is just crazy to think about. When other departments started pulling out, the brothers pushed back. They're not leaving. We're not leaving. If you guys want to leave, go. But don't kick us out because we're, we're not leaving. One day passed, then another, and another. It kind of felt like a machine. The days started to blur. At some point, you just... We were, we'd, we'd leave at 2 in the morning and go home and sleep for an hour and be back here at 3 or 4. And hope started to dwindle. That last week was pretty disheartening because you, you started kind of getting that feeling like maybe we're not going to find these last two. Then finally. 43rd person on the 43rd day. Their promise to each other and the families fulfilled. Now, 10 years later, the brothers are still volunteer firefighters. They still give their all to their community. I think I just, you know, we're, we're 10 years, right? The memorial is finished, but for us, it's never really finished. Their mission now is to make sure that no one ever forgets what happened here. We're never going to forget the 43 we lost. The resilience that I've seen in the, you know, the family members, um, the community members that, you know, helped us out there. It's amazing, right? It's, it's 10 years later, you know, life does go on. Um, everybody's moving forward, but never forgetting is the most important part. A lot has changed in Oso over the last decade, but Tim and Willie Harper still embody those words found on the wall. Dedicated, brave, strong. They're truly heroes, and their legacy will continue on with the next generation. That's because Willie's two sons, Landon and Levi Harper, just joined the Oso Fire Department a few months ago and are now volunteer firefighters with the department, getting to work alongside their dad and uncle. They were just seven and nine years old when the landslide hit, and now they're continuing the Harper legacy. So they're, they're both getting into that uh, as a career, and, and that's fun for me, but when they come down Tuesday nights for drills and then we're on our way home, it's only a mile away, but these quick little conversations they have about, oh, that was fun, or this was, you know, that was an interesting drill, or, um, you know, I can't believe how that call went, or whatever, it's, it's fun to share that with them. Yeah, it's, it, it's that true small town community um, sense of dedication, I guess. And that is just so great to see. And it sounds like that those boys that were impacted by what they saw in their dad and in their uncle, and they're going to continue to do good for their community. And that is really what this small town is really all about. Yeah, they've certainly learned service before self, and they've now proven that through two generations. Next, as we look back at the stories of Oso, we'll introduce you to the chaplain who spent weeks counseling families and first responders. I just had to kind of wrestle with the fact that I might not know why. How he held on to faith in the face of tragedy and how those weeks changed the trajectory of his life and... Honoring the past, but allowing them to um, feel a sense of hope and resilience for the future. A permanent place to grieve. We'll take you inside the slide memorial dedicated to the people we lost that day and the first responders who gave their all to the community.
a special edition, remembering Oso 10 years later. Welcome back as we honor the communities of Oso, Darrington, and Arlington 10 years after the largest landslide in U.S. history. This half hour, we'll get a look inside this permanent memorial. And we'll talk to the chaplain who helped so many families here as they continue to grieve and wait to see if their loved ones had been found. We're here at the permanent memorial, unveiled 10 years to the day since the slide happened. We're going to give you a tour of everything you can see when you come to visit here coming up. Doesn't of family members, first responders, and members of the community came here to pay their respects. We read the 43 names, as I said. We also read the 11 names of the survivors, as we typically do, just to honor them. And um, you had a benediction prayer, and then uh, Amazing Grace was played on the bagpipes, which is always uh, one of the more moving parts. There's usually not a dry eye in the area. So that's just kind of an overview of what we did. And um, as I said, it's, it's just indicative of what we try to do every year to keep the memories of our loved ones alive. The memorial is now open to the public so anyone can come here and pay tribute. Initially, there were 43 trees planted on the side of the road, and although family members thought that was touching, they wanted something more permanent and meaningful. So three years ago, the Snohomish County Council approved nearly $5 million to help build this permanent memorial. We also talked to family members who have come here to pay their respects and say it's emotionally overwhelming. And we've spoken with first responders who are honored here for all of the work that they did. Photojournalist Michael Driver takes us through the memorial. It happened at 10.37 a.m. on a sunny Saturday, March 22nd, 2014. It has been something that was promised from early on that there would be a permanent memorial here. So we wanted to give a space where people could gather. SR 530 Slide Memorial is the permanent memorial to remember and honor the victims and the responders from the landslide that happened here March 22nd, 2014. It literally is beyond my dreams of what I expected to be there. The emotions start when you get there, but then as you walk through it, things start picking away at you. And the very last, most eastern part of it is the family area. 43 people were lost and a whole community was lost by the landslide that fell. The themes of each of the panels was tailored by each of the families that gave their input on what they wanted it to look like. Every single panel has a story uh, behind it. It's very symbolic. Every, every single panel has a very symbolic element. This one includes a little Winnie the Pooh picture. Sano is just a little baby, only four months old and um, in her grandmother's arms when the slide hit that day. So I know how important this memorial for the family members. It isn't easy emotionally or physically to do the construction of a site like this. My all efforts went to create this, this park um, full of light and hope. Even for people that don't know anything about it, if, as they walk through there, they're going to get a really good understanding of the geology, of the response, and of the people that were out there. So. It's amazing. This area is the geology area. It's unique because it includes a lot of the signs about what happened here and why and how the hillside fell down. I think that this is a big milestone in the community healing process. You know, when you lost your loved ones, life is not will be the same again. Your life can change in, a, in an instant, completely outside your control. But uh, it's very important to uh, keep the memory in your heart and to move forward. When you lost your loved ones, you are here to remember and to pronounce their names. So this place will be the place of the healing and full of hope.
And what I really like about this memorial is just those simple benches too, because people can come here, sit down, reflect, the families can come here. And also the fact that we have this uh, covered area, David, and also uncovered, so people can come here all types of weather. Yeah, the artwork is spectacular yeah. too, and having every family have their own memorial here, you're gonna wanna spend some time just reflecting as you wind around through the path here at the memorial and definitely bring your camera because there are things to take pictures of just about everywhere you look. Coming up. Or if it were up to me and just to my own strength and everything going on, I would have found a nice quiet corner to huddle down, be in the fetal position, you know, just hiding and getting getting out of everything. A chaplain tries to answer the question in everyone's mind. Why? How he guided an entire community through the most devastating time in their lives and how this landslide changed the course of his life forever. So marking 10 years since the deadly landslide killed 43 people. And the time their family members spent out here waiting for any kind of answer were grueling. But they had one person to lean on for emotional and spiritual support. Yeah, that's right. One of the key people who spent days here helping grieving families was a chaplain. His name was Joel Johnson, and this event changed his entire future. Fox 13's John Hopperstad has his story. Lord God, we thank you once again for your presence. In the most basic definition, a chaplain is a member of a clergy who leads religious services. In Oso, that title took on a meaning no one could have ever imagined, including Joel Johnson himself. Well, I was the first responding chaplain to come on scene. Johnson, or Chappie, as he's lovingly called, had just become a new father. He and his wife bringing their daughter home a few days before. But on the morning of March 22nd, 2014, his job took on a 
higher meaning. And so my role as a chaplain, I thought I was going to go kind of be the liaison between the family and some resources. You know, that's a scary thing to have something move, you know, barn, whatever it may be. In the quiet community of Oso, that was an ordinary call. But within minutes, he knew this would be anything but ordinary. It quickly grew from, again, something very simple to something very complex. And then as time went on, more and more agencies got evolved to eventually it becoming, you know, a declaration of a, of a federal emergency. And here you have this community out here. It was one of the only, like, kind of cluster of houses, and it had to happen there. And at one point, you know, we were, like, around 200 names of, of people that were missing or, you know, family couldn't connect or whatever. He spent the next 38 days supporting victims' families, first responders, and members of the community. Chappie was now in charge of guiding a town in mourning through the healing process. Among his responsibilities, the grueling task of notifying family members that their loved ones were gone. Connecting with people if, if one of our loved ones was recovered and then just could start the process with a bunch of other chaplains that helped with notifications and support and with the Emmy's office, Sheriff's office. Witnessing that anguish firsthand is enough to break anyone, but Chappie leaned on something he always knew he could count on, his faith. If it were up to me and just in my own strength and everything going on, I would have found a nice quiet corner to huddle down, be in the fetal position, you know, just hiding and getting getting out of everything, but recognizing that, you know, for, with my faith background and everything, recognizing that I could lean on the strength that God gives me, help me to, you know, beyond my natural abilities, just go and, and help others. These tragedies can make people question their faith. For this chaplain, it was no different. I just had to kind of wrestle with the fact that I might not know why, and I might not be able to offer a good explanation, but what I can do instead is offer the support and the promise to to the first responders in the area and to the families that have stuck this out for almost 10 years now that I'll be there for them and support them however they need it. One of the things that helped drive him, watching the community come together. Bought, I think, like 100 hamburgers and cheeseburgers, and I'm inferring this a little bit, but it seemed like it was a personal sacrifice for them to, to make, you know, to make the time to spend their hard-earned money to come and support us. And to me, that was just indicative of what was to come, just the outpouring of support from the local community and the larger region, state, nationally, and even internationally. And believing that there is a greater purpose. That landslide on that day in that small town of Oso on that road changed the trajectory of this man's entire life. I was working, uh, volunteering as a chaplain, working as a chaplain for first responders. Um, and then basically from March 22nd on, it, it changed. I, I had been full-time at a church in, um, in Arlington and then kind of went and switched everything to the first responder world after that. I still volunteer and serve as a chaplain. But he still carries on one important message. There was a, a verse that came up very quickly um, for me out of the Bible. It was found in, found in Psalms 119. It just says, uh, Lord, sustain me as you promise. Don't let my hope be crushed. And so that was just something I hung on to and continue to hang on to this day. In the most basic definition, a chaplain is a member of a clergy who leads religious services. In Oso and in Joel Johnson, that title means more than anyone could ever imagine. And that is what Oso is about. Our team has spent so much time here over the last 10 years, and every single person would tell you that they were struck by the closeness of this community, how they were there for each other, even if they didn't know them personally. They had so much support. The donations that came in really helped the families and the first responders, and it was truly incredible to see. And the people who came here personally to offer help from Canada, Eastern Washington, all over our state and area. Now coming up, we're going to pay tribute to the 40 Three lives lost that day.
Remembering also 10 years later, we got a chance to talk to some of the family members to see what this memorial means to them. I saw her coming towards me, but I saw a look in her face that I knew something was going on because she had the look of terror in, our, in her eyes. And uh, as I reached for her and she reached for me, the slide hit and she disappeared. And I remember, I don't know how long later it was, but I remember waking up in a spot that I wasn't sure what it was. I thought I was in my garage. Found out later I was not in the garage. I was actually about 500 yards down the hill, um, down in the ground in a dry, a dry hole, thank, thank the Lord, so I could breathe. And uh, I started calling out. Eventually, I got someone to answer me, and the, the person was a, a neighbor of mine that lived over on Seapost Road, Chris Langdon. And uh, he, he eventually got over to me, and I, and I can't tell you how long it took, but it was a while. And I was doing a, what the, in the military they would call a full body assessment. It, when, if you crashed your helicopter or whatever, and that was my, my job in the military, I was a pilot. Um, and if you got into a crash, the first thing you wanted to do is find out what's broke, what's not broke. <clears throat> And as I was checking myself out, I got down to my arms and to my fingers, and then I got to my chest, and things were looking good. I'm thinking, this isn't too bad. I'm not feeling anything. And then I got down to my waist, and I was facing this way, and my legs were facing that way. And I'm thinking, that's not right. I mean, I'm a guy from the South, but I can figure that part out. And uh, I had broken pretty much every bone in my pelvis. And my right hip was broken off from my pelvis area. Um, I remember them digging me out, and it took quite a while. I don't know how many hours it was, but I remember I did a lot of screaming. I remember they were being as compassionate as they could, but they had a they had to get people out and I had no idea at the time but I found out later months later that they had found my wife just about 25 yards from where they had found me but she was not in an air pocket she was underwater Dane, everybody processes grief differently. Some want to just kind of put it behind them. Others really want to make sure that their loved one is remembered. And I noticed right off the bat that you're wearing a sweatshirt there, which tells me how you feel about this. Tell us what's on your sweatshirt. It's uh, always remembered, never forgotten. It's a design that we came up with at about year three uh, after the slide. And it marks the remembrance that we observe every year on March 22nd, where we pay tribute to the 43 victims that were lost in the Oso landslide. Let's see the back of that sweatshirt too because that really stands out as well. And of course your sister was one of the 43 lost that day. Uh, people can hear maybe the trucks going by on the highway right out here. Yes. And she was just going to uh, see her horses, a, a huge horse lover, yes. just happened to be driving by at the time. So how did that play into the memorial here that's that's built in her honor? Well, that was that was her mantra. Her her theme in life was she was a very hard worker and she was a farrier uh, by trade, and so she was actually headed about seven miles on the other side of here to to shoe one of her horses, and she never made it to her destination. She got caught up in the slide that day in the worst possible area, worst c catastrophic area of the slide where it actually took out part of the paved road and uh, it entombed her in her in her car and um, we didn't we didn't know it for a few few days you can't see it now but when the sun shines just right it reflects here yes. on the ground it's one of the first things that I, that I walked up what's your impression uh, about this memorial um, and what people uh, will see when they come here but we, we want everyone that comes here to know that there is a story and a livelihood and a tradition that carries on with each of the 43 victims and that was the case with summer but i also fought for this for the other 42 victims and the 11 survivors i wanted 
the world to know their legacies and to know what they stood for other than a tree or just a pile of dirt. We wanted their stories to be told and that's what we did and that's what we made happen. It is beautifully done. I've asked so many people if they feel like it was 10 years ago. Do you feel like this was 10 years ago? No, no, David. It feels, it feels like it was yesterday. It's, uh, I, I just go through this in my mind over and over again, that first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, fifth day was when I pulled her out of her car. And it literally feels like, feels like yesterday. It's, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think of this event and not a day that goes by that I don't think of my sister. Dave, we're honored to be able to talk to you about this and we hope many people come and see it and uh, celebrate her life and also reflect on what was lost here. Thank yes. you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us as we look back at Oso 10 years later. We're just so grateful to this community for inviting us here, allowing us to tell their stories, and there's just so many more to tell. We hope you'll take the opportunity to come to the memorial and learn about the people who lost their lives that day, the survivors, and the heroic first responders. And as we say goodbye, we're going to honor the 43 people who lost their lives.